Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Indie 3. Today's day five. And before our main program, we're starting early today because we want to bring to you guys some amazing panels on the main Indie 3 channel. We have the we have the space, we have the time, and so we want to put people in front of uh, the big stage while we while we can. So uh, we are going to instead of be doing this on the Indie 4 channel on Indie 3 today, we are going to start the show with a panel called uh, "What Not to Do with Native Americans in Games," and this will be hosted by Manuel Marcano and Elizabeth La Pense. I will I will go ahead and bring them in. And here they are. Uh, everybody, uh, feel free to introduce yourselves. Hello. Hi, my name is um, Benoit Marcano, and um, I'm a former AAA dev who used to work at Rockstar and Take Two, and uh, now I'm a indie game designer. Anine, my name is Elizabeth Ponce, and I am an Anishinaabe, Métis, and Irish. Game writer and designer. I started off um, doing game writing and working for people like uh, Andy Schatz on um, independent titles and then um, broke away into doing my own work, um, collaborating closely with indigenous communities on self-determining our own games. All right, then I will, uh, just to get things started off, uh, what not to do with Native Americans games. It sounds, uh, Mar uh, Manuel, it sounds like you have a very tight history with uh, AAA industry and what is happening in the game scenes, especially with Native Americans. Um, well, sadly, we don't really get represented very well, even, even in the companies that I worked at. Like, I worked on The Darkness, uh, Bioshock, I mean, the, the one game that would have that I would have worked on was a uh, Red Dead, but I wasn't there for that. <laughs> um, can you can you guys talk about where we're seeing Native Americans in games right now? Um, well, right now we're not even in like you know what what people would call like the black exploitation phase in terms of seeing. Uh, people of color of any kind represented in games like generally they're meek or they're like a secondary character with the exception of like Assassin's Creed which I have some feels about um, <laughs> <laughs> that's like we we don't necessarily get the spotlight so it's hard to to say anything about how we're being represented when everything's a misrepresentation to start with. Yeah, and the best to date, I would say, as far as AAA titles go, is definitely Assassin's Creed. They, Ubisoft um, made the effort uh, to consult with the community there and use the language and go back through. And of course, you know, this is understanding that it's fictional to a lot of extent, there's time travel or there's, you know, there's stuff going on in there that isn't realistic, but at the same time, um, to date, out of all the games that I've seen put out on that kind of level, uh, they've done the best work with interacting with the community and seeking them out and actually involving them in the process. And it still has spirit journeys. For sure, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Like, that's, that's one of the things I really like to get into. Like, I mean, granted, that's that's not my culture. I'm a Southern, you know, I'm, fr I'm from the Caribbean. I'm from Borinquen, which you know, is more commonly known as Puerto Rico. But um, it's, it's, even though it's not my culture, and I can't really comment on it because they did get the permission of the people whose culture this was, um, it there's certain things that apply to all of us or get get pushed on all of us like it's it's an assumption that we all have the same cu culture we all have the same language like you know you'll see movies or games where someone will say well this is an old indian word for this but the truth is the truth is like 
a Mohawk doesn't speak the same language as a Taino. A Taino doesn't speak the same language as Ashinabe, who doesn't speak the same language as Mexica. Like, you know, we're all very different cultures and very, very different languages. So we all get the eagle feathers and and uh, spirit journeys in video games. And that was something that bothered me about Assassin's Creed. Yeah, that's very true. And I've run across this too. I mean, when you look back at the early titles, and there are two perspectives on this. My eyes were opened a little bit recently by talking to um, Bear Witness, who's a member of the DJ crew, A Tribe Called Red. And he brought up to me that, you know, growing up as... Um, as a young man and you know in his earlier days he was just excited to see any native representation at all and that's really true i mean myself as a as a woman and as a girl growing up i didn't have female representations to go to so what did i jump to night wolf you know and at the time it was really cool but when you look back at it a lot of those characters are just the keeper of their people the protector of their people, but you don't actually know who their people are. It's just completely left open. And so there's a lot of lack of um, acknowledging the differences that happen between nations, and which is very vital because that it means differences in land, differences in cultural teachings, differences in even what we're, you know, how we're allowed to approach things. For example, recently um, a man told me, uh, he's Navajo, and he told me that Navajo people do not speak uh, to their ancestors, it's considered dishonorable to do so. And um, whereas for my people, that's not an issue. Uh, and so if I were to put out a game where that might happen, then I could possibly be offending Navajo people without even being aware of it myself, because I'm coming from an Anishinaabe and Métis perspective. So we have to be mindful of how varied the differences in our beliefs are, because it will affect our game design. Uh, like, um, I mean, I plan to at some point make more games about my culture and you know there's there's a lot of talking to ancestors especially through animals so i mean i'm gonna put that in a game and i'm probably gonna offend somebody but like you know this is my culture like this is my part of what you know what defines me as a native american whereas it, it's just kind of silly that we're all held to one standard but at no the same different. time, and then at the same time, we caution for other developers not to fall back on the mystic savage stereotype, which happens so often. Yeah. And I know that um, that all of us have um, spoken about this as a community, those of us who are involved in, um, in game development, that uh, you have to be really mindful because um, it is my belief that spirit can actually come through games. Now, you know, that's, that's me and my perspective, but... Um, Recently, Brenda Romero, um, who herself is not native, but her husband, John Romero, who created Doom is, he's Yaqui and Cherokee. And she, um, in part, connected to John um, being Cherokee, is currently working on a game called Trail of Tears for her, well, it's actually called One Falls for Each of Us, uh, based on the Trail of Tears for her Mechanic is a Message series. And she, too, has had experiences where, you know, emotions are brought through in the game. Spirit is brought through in the game. The game will speak to you. It's not just about us um, walking into development saying we're creating this. We're actually waking up cultural aspects of ourselves uh, as we make these games. And so for someone else to do that on behalf of our culture without knowing anything about our culture walks a really dangerous line. You know, you really always have to have consultants and people who are involved uh, in this kind of work. Yeah, well, my my very good friend, Sean Allen, uh, gave a talk at um, PAX, as well as a few other a few other places like NYU, about how bringing culture into games is making them better, you know, especially uh, you know urban hip hop and and inner city culture. And one of the things he talks about is not just appropriating, but going to the source of that culture and you know trying to integrate it heavily and and accurately with your work. I think that's that's something that should always be done, but 
with Native Americans has to be done more because it just seems like so just stuff happening on, on our behalf. And also a quick aside, Doom was the first uh, the first thing I ever like tried to reprogram. Like I made Doom mods. Yeah, it sounds that a lot of people um, really like if we look at it like globally and, and take a step back and really look at who's been involved in game industry from the very start, recognizing John Romero as someone who is indigenous completely changes everything for us because there are a lot of people, native and non-native, who started off by modding in that way. And so, um, and the way that he started, he recently told me was that um, he was sneaking into a university library to use the computer there and just nobody caught, you know, nobody cared. They were actually encouraging him and then he would go to stores and learn how to code on store, you know, on store computers. So we have um, no excuses today, as he says, um, for us to be involved in creating our own self-determined representations because he himself is a self-taught coder and he did it with absolutely nothing and no access at all. And so it's very possible um, with the widened amount of access, although there is still limited access on reservations um, due to poverty and just generally uh, also with internet connections can get really um, iffy out that way. But nonetheless, there are a lot more resources now than there were when he started. So it's a call to action at this point for us to get directly involved in this kind of work. Absolutely. Um, another thing I want to, to touch upon really quickly was like, I didn't go to E3 this year because I'm busy working on Treachery and Beatdown City. Hint, hint, wink, wink. But, um... Uh, last year, I went and I was hanging out with, you know, developer Suda51 of, you know, No More Heroes and Killer7 fame, as well as a bunch of other you know, well-known Japanese developers. And you know, for most of them, I was the first skin that they'd ever met. Whoops. Can I say skin? Um, we can. We can. That's our word. Um, but like... Uh, I was the first one. I was the first Native American that they that many of them had ever met. For most of them, they their only outlet, or their their only knowledge of any cultures from from this continent, aside from you know American cultures, was watching Twin Peaks. They were all like, "You you remind me of Hawk," <laughs> which was like so weird because I'm nothing like Hawk. But that, that was the only thing that they had to compare me to. And I've noticed traveling that people from around the world really don't know a lot about, you know, the indigenous cultures here. So a lot of that ends up getting lost in translation. Yeah, and then the thing that's happened to me is that um, a lot of times uh, I would be jumped to as the person because they go, well, who do we know who's native? Well, we'll go to her. And then my um, immediate reaction is always to try to find a way to put us all in touch with the appropriate communities because that's what it really comes down to is we each need to be self-determined in this space. And, um, and it makes the game better. It makes everything much richer if we um, involve people, because in the kind of work that I'm doing, it affects the game mechanics. You know, we you find very often um, with native representations and games that we're running into things like real time strategy games where the mechanics themselves actually are completely against indigenous ways of knowing. And so, you know, you're you're literally looking at a map that's flattened, like they're flattening land, which to us has always been understood in a three-dimensional way and even in, in a, you know, multi-dimensional way as well, uh, into this 2D representation and then literally watching as territory is marked in this space and, and you know, relating experiences where you don't actually see what's on the map until you've quote unquote discovered it. I mean, these are completely colonial mechanics. And so the way that we can work uh, towards our own self-determination is by getting into the space and working in our own game mechanics, things 
that follow our cultural values like gratitude and stewardship, land stewardship, you know, how about instead of just taking resources all the time with no kind of ability to replenish, we're actually working in mechanics where there is a balance because that's what we, that's what traditionally my people did and a lot of people did uh, where there is a, a misconception very often that native people were somehow um, not uh, managing the land, but we were, we were caretakers of the land and we just did it in a way that was, uh, you know, you know, one term could be called sustainable, but it was, um, a form of tending that we knew for many, many years. And a lot of that traditional ecological knowledge is coming back. And so if we could have, um, you know, procedural generated content that relates to our teachings, that's the direction for us to go in. Yeah, I think that's, that's, a big thing that games in general need to realize that you you don't have a whole a horse culture, you know, walking around, you know, barefoot. You don't have a bow culture using tomahawks. You don't have a culture that doesn't have tomahawks using tomahawks. <laughs> yeah. Like, like I mean, that's we don't have tomahawks in my culture. We have manaya, and manaya are functionally the same, but look totally different and like even though we weren't you know land tenders we weren't really farmers we were hunters like th these things don't have i've never seen a game where you know it's okay for a a macaw feather wearing man to start like eating people and using a manaya you know you'll always see a, a engine trying to scalp someone or or using a tomahawk but that's like not a reality that exists for me and like there there are ways to put mechanics from my people um in games but it, it that that thought never occurs to most game designers Yeah, and even then, like when we're working in these spaces, um, one of the things that I see when we're working with weapons and all of that kind of area is that, and especially this happens in RTSs too, um, is that we're always put at a disadvantage. Like technologically, we're set as behind other people, which um, can make it very difficult for us. And so evening that out a little bit and having something other than, you know, um, in age of empires uh the native spinoff of that they the add-on that they had for the native cultures was um dancing around a fire pit you know like oh they're gonna the indians are dancing around a pit of fire and that's gonna bolster their ability to gather resources like don't do that <laughs> you know give us yeah. advantages but don't do that <laughs> don't just jump straight to mysticism Because like that mysticism might not even like just why why does it always have to be the noble savage with the black magic? Exactly. And if it is an elder, which has been done sometimes, but the way that I've seen it done typically has been really, really, really off. Like in Prey, they have the the you know, kind of wise elder character um in a bar, uh in regalia of some sort of basis. And then he's holding a beer. Like, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the gesture and at least having, like, a, a human, you know, elder character, you know, father, grandfather, that kind of, those kinds of figures, sure. But, like, you know, if he's if he's giving you advice drinking alcohol, I, no, don't do that, guys. That's, like, a really wrong direction to go. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the worst direction to go. I mean, like, um, I, I play a lot of games with the people in my tribe. So, like, my mom, my dad, my sister. And I mentioned it last night in, in one of the chats on, on Indie 3 that when we got up to the place that Nanaki or Red 13 is from, we started hearing, like, this, these, you know, northern drums and, like, this will be considered, like, a native beat. And we were all wondering, like... 
Why is the native guy a dog? <laughs> like, is that the representation we get <laughs> in Final Fantasy VII? We get a dog? He was an awesome dog, but why are we dogs? Yeah, that's happened a lot, too. I mean, it, go it goes even further in games like World of Warcraft, where, I mean, directly there are, like, these cow-like, you know... We, we know what race we are. It's pretty easy to tell when you walk into that game, like, what character you're, you're inspiring, you know? Um, yeah. And how off those representations can be in terms of the vision quests. And just thinking about the fact that we are genuinely real people and when that happens. And in general, World of Warcraft is, like, way off in general. You know, like, yeah. they, they're doing that to a lot of different cultures. I think the most important thing about all of this, too, is to acknowledge that this isn't just happening to Native people. It happens on a much larger scale in game industry in general. And what um, we personally are doing in our own work is to correct that through our own self-determination, but then also... Just to just to give a little bit of a challenge, like at this point, Ubisoft has done it. They've brought in and paid consultants, and so there are no excuses anymore. There's a process for it. Everybody should do this um, if they're going to involve any kind of culture. Because first off, it's just inappropriate otherwise. And then secondly, it really will make your game so much better. Um, but you find like even then, you know, the buffalo characters, that the animal um forms that we take on uh that could be a part of someone's teachings but if they are then it just needs to be done in a way that has finesse um and yeah. respect to the actual traditional stories to to provide a, a fairly two fairly good examples of that like i mean i don't think anyone was involved with this in terms of tainos but um in the in the Yi series which is this old jrpg going back to like 80s um there's this there's this place called the vortex of canaan and it's supposed to be the caribbean and you know those are that they have a culture of native people who are like these beast men and at first i was like really offended that they that falcom turned us into beast men but then when i got into playing uh ye six they actually nailed like the colors the music and even like a lot of the philosophy and I was like, wow, how did they even know we exist? Like they, they did some, some real research to make sure that it, even though they turned us into beast men, at least we were beast men in a world of elves. Like it, it was alternate reality altogether and they paid us respect. And another example, which again is alternate reality in Japanese is Skies of Arcadia. Someone put a lot of love into Ixataka. Like, everything about that is spot on, from the music to the colors to the dress. So, I mean, there, there are some examples of, even necessarily, even not with getting permission from the peoples, doing a really good job of taking cultural aspects from them. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, too, how it's um, more often people who are further removed. Um, because people who are in Turtle Island, that's, you know, North America here, at, so at some points, you know, we're so much closer to it. And so it's easier just to say, oh, well, that's a, a character that fits in the scheme. And I know something about it because I'm from this area. But really, it is very true that even just doing basic research uh, can enrich anything that you're working on very deeply. Uh, I've seen like a, a couple comments asking about Turok. That's like a, a can of worms. Like I have so many feelings on that, both positive and negative, that it's hard to really talk about. The thing about Turok for me is like, okay, I mean, I was told I totally had a crush on that character when I. By the way, you know, so I mean, it's Same hard because I was like, I was like, that's nice. Like this is nice, right? And so. It was it was awesome. I mean, and he kicks ass. He's got a tech bow. I mean, who would not want a tech bow? I want a tech bow. That's that's amazing. I love that. But the thing about it too is that um, you know, there's a whole spectrum of history with all of the games and how the um, representations vary. 
along the way. And the thing that I had the most trouble with out of all the games and all the years that all of the different versions have been coming out was the latest version. Because in the latest version, they had a white mentor guiding him and telling Turok how to be Indian, basically, or how to be native. He was the one who was passing on that. That's what got me. That hurt. That actually hurt. Like everything else from before, and it was based on, you know, a comic. And so you, you forgive things because of the time period to some extent. And you're just really excited to be represented at all because, you know, it's really cool. And you've got all this science fiction element working in there and so that was fine but to see that was actually hurtful because what that did was they were able they were identifying a tribe for him they were naming him and then they were taking away the power of the character and giving it to a a white guy and saying that he had more of the teachings than Turok himself did so that I had a problem with that for sure I I think there's a really big problem in media in general like with with like this white character telling you know certain other cultures how to feel like it's something i've been seeing a lot of lately i, I noticed it uh I, I stopped watching girls but i noticed that in an episode of it and like i, I mean also even like assassin's creed 4 kind of has it with with um hytham and and i hate calling him, him connor so i'm just gonna call him Red- on Kadon. Um like he's he's trying to tell him how to live. I mean, you know, you're you're a white guy. You're you're not supposed to tell me how to be a good engine. And I think probably the impact um in that would be even more so for men and for young boys. I mean, we have to think about how this is affecting our youth um from the start because these kinds of representations are what is leading us. And if that's how it's going down from, you know, this militarized perspective and portraying him as, you know, in fact, um, you know, from the prison perspective, all these kinds of things are very, 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 very real in our communities. They're not, yeah. this isn't light, you know, this is actually like, there is a huge problem with incarceration. There's a huge, there are a lot of issues that go along here and there's a lot of healing that has to be done. And so, you know, I would much prefer to see games, um, addressing the healing and, uh, putting, you know, using, uh, aspects of our teachings, um, that are genuine and true, you know, there, there are things too that just that get missed. So, um, for example, when I was working on uh, a game early on, it's a social impact game, so it wouldn't really fit in the video game world. But um, the conversations that came out of it will inform game development for me for my life, my whole life. Uh, when I first started talking about developing survivance with Haida storyteller and elder Woodrow Morrison Jr., he told me about this Haida word, it's all. And it's all means, uh, well, it can refer to different things, but literally what it means is to pass into another reality. And so the original form of the word meant, um, was in reference to a type of bark on a tree that you would ingest and then you would pass into another reality. Well, later on, it became a pillow when pillows were introduced to the community. And so then it became... Um, you know, the pillow, that which helps you pass into another reality, the dream reality. And then um, it also um, came to be the meaning of the sinker uh, when you're fishing. So you put the sinker on the fish line and then the, the hook and the fish line are pulled down into the water reality. So against all for that. And so as we were talking, we were talking about a game interface uh, being to a form of it's all. And so our tradition is... Uh, you know, is has roots, we're very well rooted, but we're also growing and we're also changing and tradition is um, constantly growing and constantly adapting. And so with that understanding, we're not relics and we're not archaic and we're not just in museums. We are here and living today and facing moments like, um, you know, just interactions at events like E3 where, you know, my own personal experience has been things like um, being introduced to someone as a Native American game designer, game writer, and then someone 
completely innocently and yet, you know, horribly asking in return, oh, Native Americans make video games? <laughs> you know, yeah, we do. <laughs> and we have been. And in fact, Doom was made by a Native American. So we have to um, really fight in these spaces to show that we are here, we are present, and that we're putting out our own work. Absolutely. And to and to kind of go back to a point that you made about uh, language, like um, in my culture, there are two things that, that have always stuck out to me and going from uh, Monaquero dialect Taino to English, because English is not my first language. Um, the first being that the word Daka, which means I, is also has a negative connotation to it so it it's it's always a bad thing to talk about yourself in terms of our culture mm. <laughs> so we all we we all have this thing like me my dad my mom everyone everyone in this tribe hates talking about themselves and you know that's that's something that i think could be expressed in a game and it would be interesting to express in a game and another thing that uh, is a huge part of our culture that is not in any other Arawak culture is that um, Monaqueros do not have gendered words. Because we don't have gendered words, our culture has, has is so weird. Um, we, there's also no gender specifics. Like, you know, there is no matriarchy or patriarchy. Whoever is the strongest is the boss. So my grandmother was the chief and then I became the chief. There was no, you know, it, it wasn't even because I was her grandson. It was just because I was the smartest and strongest that we had available. And like when it when it comes down to even like, you know, things like sexuality and and, you know, who who is in charge or who is is doing something, you know, it's a free for all because like my mom works and my dad cooks and you know i i i'm kind of like this mr mom type person who takes care of of my nephew and i i would really love to bring that to games you know the the ideas of you know gender neutrality and and just you know bringing uh bringing female characters who are not like seen as female characters like um i know that makes absolutely no sense but the way that i think of it is like you know dwayne jones in as ben in night of the living dead you know no character comments on the fact that he's black which makes it a super progressive movie because no one is seeing him by the color of his skin i i kind of i really want to do that with games like where there is a female character and you know even though it, it is there are some female connotations applied to it they just see this character as being a, a strong-willed or or strong character yeah that's so true i mean there's um you think about it there's been some gender neutrality in in general and it would be really beautiful to see that from a cultural perspective because right now i mean if you look at native representations in video games well looking at representations of female native people in video oh it's so bad it it brings it to a whole other level that um i i think i'm uh, supposed to like give a trigger warning here what i'll do is probably not even talk about it too much i'll just put up some tweets um, and you guys can see that because even I myself as someone um, who has had personal experiences with assault and in the game industry, by the way, because yes, all women, <laughs> it's not something that I want to get into too much because I'm just not interested in the poison anymore. But I do think that it's important for us to acknowledge what has been done and how we can move forward. And there are a couple of different ways. And one is actually acknowledging the power of, of women. For me, I come from a, a, a world or, you know, a culture, Anishinaabe. We are um, more of a matriarch and um, we are peacekeepers. So there's that kind of tone to it. Um, for the Haida people, it's actually, there is a chief and the chief is male, but there's always a council of women 
Um, so the decisions are actually led by the women more than they are by the man. He's more of the, of the voice. And so just being given an opportunity for every one of us to sit down together and share our different ways of being um, and all of these different stories, I believe that, you know, by next year, you know, both of us when we're talking, and then I think just in general, there are a lot of other people out there who are working on projects right now and games that will be able to move into these spaces showing that um, these different concepts of gender fluidity, um, two-spirit nature, uh, you know, the different roles that we had, the fact that a warrior doesn't just mean to fight, you yeah. know, that's, that's not what it was about. Like warriors carried water to the community. It meant so much more than just going out and, and killing. Um, just to, to give a little bit of background, like uh, me and Beth know this, but uh, in most cultures, uh, Native American cultures, two spirits refers to uh, either transgender or, you know, multigender people. And again, this is something where, you know, it's not necessarily agreed upon across all peoples either yeah. so we all have different understandings we all have um different ways of knowing um that have either been changed by colonization or um or and are being recovered now or are true to um the ways of being as they've been uh, for lifetimes absolutely um I was going to make a point, but I, I it just kind of slipped away when I mentioned the two the two spirit thing. Sorry. That's okay. I'm I'm going to start posting up um, the tweets about the native representations that specific to females because a lot of it is you combine um, the sexualizing that happens and then the basically this position that we are not human, right? Uh, yeah. In general. So you layer both on top of one another, and then what comes out is really twisted. And so um, uh, there's even more deplorable stuff. Like I think they're, you know, the kind of like me speak big heap Indian kind of language um, is often coming out of the female representations. Um, even so, like uh, in Dark Watch, Dark Watch was supposed to be led by um, Tala. She was supposed to be the protagonist. I talked to High Moon Studios about this some time ago, I believe at an E3. Um, I, I spoke with them and I was laughing about it. I was, uh, I was saying to them, do you realize like exactly what you did here? Because you have this very sultry vam vampire native female juxtaposed with this white innocent cowgirl who gets killed early on in the game and becomes a spirit who's guiding like this an angel it was basically like vampire and the angel kind of a juxtaposition and i asked him do you like are are you like aware that you're doing this because i'm not sure sometimes that people even know what it is that they're doing and they said um in all honesty they were being very genuine that um, that she wasn't she, she wasn't evil. She was just uh, looking out for herself. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay. I mean, that's fair enough. But um, they told me that originally Tala was supposed to be the player character, and they brought it to marketing, and the marketing department said that will not sell, and so she was removed from that role. And then later became the first video game character in Playboy. Cause that's awesome. Like that, like what? Yeah. Why? So why is it that we're, we're not going to sell as a player character, but we're going to sell in Playboy? Well, thanks. Well, you know, that pretty much sums it up, right? This, this is like, again, trigger warning. Like Native American women are the most likely to have, you know, to be sexually assaulted in some way. I mean, even Native American men have a very high rate of, of sexual assault. I'm, I don't really, for for the most part, I don't know many natives who haven't been, myself exactly. included. Yeah. So it's it's the fact that we're fetishizing our the fact that our people are being fetishized, and then 
this is still going on and we have this culture that is is constantly abusive for us um you know it, it just culminates in getting worse you know the yeah go ahead no i was i was just i'm trying to turn this around because we're going dark places but it's yeah, the reality for that. us no it's totally i think it's appropriate because at some point we do have to speak up we do have to say this is this is the reality that we live in you know there's um regular abuse that happens from um even police even today this very morning uh there was a story that came out about an aboriginal woman um who was uh greatly harmed uh and this is we're not being protected and so if we're not being protected and then um, then it really should be taken seriously when uh, when we're being portrayed as characters simply to be killed or simply to be harmed um, in some way. And this is done even still now. And um, and sometimes it's done in really tricky kind of ways, like in gun, uh, you spend a good part of the game uh, killing native people. And the thing about it that's really weird from a design standpoint, of course, I'm going to be the type of person that's going to notice things like this, right? The um, Literally, the sounds that were recorded when Native people die are longer and more gruesome than any other character type in the game. And so... It's just so odd. It creates such an odd feeling. And then they try to flip it around and gun where it turns out that you're a half breed or you're a mixed blood. And so then that's supposed to somehow right the wrong that, you know, you yourself are native. You go through some period of semi guilt, but then realize that the, well, those native people aren't your native people. So now you're native too. And now you're going to be hero and walk into that role. So it, it even twisted a bit more in that one to a point where that game was actually boycotted. And I don't know how much game it is really knows about that um but the native community certainly knows that yeah. that that happened you know that there there was some action against boycotting it um that one as well as custer's revenge um custer's revenge was boycotted and they were promised that all of the copies would be removed from shelves but there are digital copies still around, um, and certainly the copies were not actually removed. Really, you know, like the it, the game was no longer made, um, but it was still around. And so these sorts of uh, pieces of representations and um, perpetuating violence um, against Native people still continue right now. Um. You, you touched on a point I actually want to go back to for a moment, briefly. Uh, the idea of half-breed heroes. And while I understand that, like, you know, like Delsin in uh, Infamous, but Tonicadon in Assassin's Creed, you know, a lot, of, a lot of these characters are, you know, half-native, but it's always like, you know, the dad was whatever culture, usually white, and the mom was... Um, native i always thought that that was like you know funny not haha funny but funny because it it's almost uh like sapping the male the male energy out of it like you know the, the you can't have a half breed character that has a native father because then that would be a positive male influence and you can't show that on screen and uh, another thing is, like, in terms of being a half-breed, like, uh, and which is a, a term I hate, but um, on my end, I'm you know, Sicilian Taino, but I'm not even, like, you know, white Sicilian. My my family is, is uh, you know, black Sicilian. They they are often called very bad name names, and usually that start with N, but like within within like uh within um being a half breed like you you're not really looked upon well by certain native communities either like i've i've gotten a lot of i've gotten a lot of abuse for being a a, a light skin like they call me a reverse apple sometimes so you know, that that's another thing that we have to contend with in terms of uh, making games because sometimes 
you know, if we were, if I were to be involved with Avatar, the game, for the movie, everyone within the native community would probably be like, what the hell is wrong with you? And I think that's, that's something else we need to, we need to look at. Yeah, it can happen from um, both a game uh, representation as a game standpoint and then also um, on a development standpoint. So I'm also, I'm mixed. And you're right, we shouldn't be using words like half-breed even. And this is something that, that Gunn perpetuated too because they use the term half-breed. And so, you know, even in our own words, it, it brings it back and it brings back that hurt. And so um, I myself am mixed and I have light skin too. And so, um, and, and, you know, growing up, people told me it was a positive sometimes because they said you can walk in both worlds. And so you're going to be able to do things that some of us would not necessarily be able to do. So I have a PhD now and um, I know that in part um, that comes from, being able to walk in those spaces and, and, and then at the same time, this real awkwardness of, um, of not ever quite belonging in any one space, but we, we have these roles, we have these lives. This is what we look like now. Um, I run into this all the time when I'm interacting with, uh, certain game developers from certain countries, um, who are not as familiar with our history and what has happened and, so someone would look at me and not even look at me as native, even though I have lived that life and I've had those experiences um, and I am a part of statistics and all of those sorts of things that come along with it, uh, they would not look at me that way. And so, um, and I don't want to have to constantly be telling my life story. That's not what I'm about. I'm about my work. And so all we can really do is continue to put it out in our work and continue to walk these paths and understand that, you know, as even both you and I talk out here right now, right here, right now, this is the start. Like saying out loud and getting the word out that Doom was made by Yaki and Cherokee, John Romero, that he is not, a lot of people somehow have forgotten that he is, um, you know, a person of diversity because he has money and he's famous. <laughs> you know, like he's from, you know, he's, you know, there's Mexican culture there too, that's happening. And so, um, and so there are those of us who are successful and are rising and um, our success should not uh, negate our background and who we are and, wh and what we came from. And so, you know, as we move forward here, I'm hoping that this kind of talk as much as I, it's really hard for me to go back and talk about all these things, because the thing about me is like, the way that I started off working on games was sneaking into academic conferences as a 15-year-old pretending to be a grad student. I don't even know how I did this. And I was presenting on native representations in games. So I've been, I've been talking about this for a long time. And I quickly realized within the first year of doing that, that if I had any hope of anything changing, I had to learn how to develop games myself. I had to be able to to code to some extent I can. I'm also um, a writer and an artist and, uh, and do the design work. And I'm also a producer. So I try to do everything I can, but I do, I will admit I have limitations in code, but that's what other people are, are for and help me with. So that's good. Like we have to work together as teams. We can't do everything on our own. And so um, my hope is that this will spark other people to acknowledge um, some part of themselves to look around um, and talk to other people who they find that are native for all of us to, to rise up together because that's what's really been happening and to, for me to find people and to bring them into the native media space um, to find the existing work because I think a lot of the times there's a lot of really amazing work that's going on that we're just not necessarily aware of because we need to communicate more with one another and because we come from different tribes, nations, cultures, areas, um, globally, we're not necessarily in contact all the time. And so all of these things will start to happen and I'm really positive about it. Do you want to open up to questions since we have about 10 minutes left here? Hey, yeah, that, that sounds like a good idea. Awesome. I'm going to keep tweeting while we do this. So if there's any questions, you know, go ahead and hit me with them now. Yeah, I'm kind of waiting for chat to catch up. Well, in the meantime, um, right now, uh, I've, I've worked on a lot of 
AAA games. Very few of them had diversity of any kind. Um, uh, one of the ones that I worked on that that was like a big thing for me was Max Payne Three, because I've I've been to Brazil and you know I know a lot of native people from there, and um, you know I, so much of that game made me want to pull my hair out. Since half breed is obviously considered a slur, what is the preferred? I can't pronounce that name by that word. Um, half breed is bad. That's that's not necessarily something you want to talk about. I, I think maybe we should just not really focus on that and just say, well, you know, I'm I'm a Sicilian Taino. I, you know, also I I don't really like Native American as a term or Indian or true. I mean, even even Indigenous peoples is a little too. Um, you know, out there because everyone's indigenous to somewhere. Uh, I, I'd always just like to be called the Taino or, you know, Manichetto. That's my tribe. I mean, I'm the chief of the tribe. <laughs> I, sh I should be that. Uh, would they, are there any other questions? Um... Let me uh, try to think of something. I'm just going to start tweeting the really dark stuff. So that's oh. that's what I'm doing over here. Yeah, in general, um, in general, I think, you know, maybe this is a call for us um, as a community, as indigenous game developers to come up with a white paper of um of terms that should be avoided or ways even better yet ways that we can seek out um interacting with communities uh and this is not to say that anyone should just walk into um you know working with native representations in games because i ran into this at gdc so i i went to the game developers conference i gave a presentation and it was on um adapting indigenous storytelling to game mechanics and the feedback on me was split 50 50. I mean, it was either absolute love or absolute hate. Like either this was the best presentation out of the entire narrative summit. I, you know, I'm really happy this was here. People saying this has changed things for me, or it was completely on the flip end where people said, I walked in here expecting to get a list of ways for me to use indigenous storytelling in games. And I didn't get that. And this was the worst speaker ever, and I didn't understand a word of what she was saying. And it was either one way or the other. It was completely one way or the other. And so what that tells me is that um, there's this really big gap that we're responsible for um, trying to fill in and for trying to create like a um, an ally formation that's happening between the two spectrums because uh, really – Really, like what I'm all about is first and foremost us representing ourselves. That would be great. And for other people to enable us to do that would be the most amazing thing. And then secondarily, if you're interested in um, looking at representing Native people in your game, that you do reach out to those of us who are connected to communities so that we can make sure that it's happening in a really good way. Oh, yeah. And I can start tweeting some resources. It's interesting actually walking the clouds and anthology of indigenous science fiction is from my mother. Um, my mother's um, Grace Dillon. She's Anishinaabe Métis. And my name, La Ponce, um, is her maiden name. And uh, and a lot, I continue the legacy of her work. Like a lot of the stuff that I do, I do now would be considered indigenous science fiction. So steampunk, but also kind of green punk. And I don't know what indigenous punk. And so what we're doing now, what she's been doing in her work is finding the spaces where we've always been telling what are considered science fiction stories. So for me, um, I was raised um, with uh, teachings of star people. And these are not, these are protected stories. And there are very exciting things unfolding right now. There's a game I'm working on right now that I can't say anything about. There are a couple of different games I'm working on right now. Um, one of which, though, uh, is starting to really get open about the the teachings of the star people. And the reason why I'm able to be open about this now in ways that I've never been before is because about in like February of this year, I was told by an elder that we're going to be allowed to tell those stories. And I thought at the time 
that a bunch of people would start coming out, that somehow these stories would come to me, that, that other storytellers would come out and start telling them. And then I realized, oh, wait, it's us. Like, it's those of us in our generation who grew up with these stories, who grew up being told, well, these are things we keep quiet and we don't share outside of our communities. We're the ones who are responsible for telling these stories. So a lot of, um, a lot of the, and we, we have words for like space canoe, there are words in our language that talk about these kinds of um, things and relate um, the, the division of the realities that we experience and our teachings of space time, not just, not just time and not space, but one cohesive interrelated relationship of space time that are going to be um, worked into games. Uh, very soon. And so those are the things I'm really, 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 really excited about is bringing back the teachings um, through game mechanics. That's brilliant. You know, you'll find things that are just not going to be um, in other games because of the ways of knowing and how are raised the cultural values. For example, I'm working on a board game right now with the Northwest Indian College, and it was supposed to be a video game. It started off that way. But when we went to the community, they said, you know, well, if you give us a video game, we can't play it. We need something like a board game. So I ended up um, having to adapt this to a board game. We're working on a traditional um, foods, traditional ecological knowledge game that focuses on foods and traditional gathering practices and the ecosystems. And, um, and through that, the mechanics are gratitude, stewardship, uh, generosity and collaboration. And you're not going to find that in a lot of other board games. You know, these are these innovations are coming out of purely um, our ways of knowing and how and how we live and what we're trying to pass on to the next generation. So I'm really excited about all the work that's going on right now. And I think by next year, there's just going to be this huge explosion of representations for us, not just in terms of here we are, um, you know, representing ourselves historically, but here we are today and now, right here and now, representing ourselves and seeing the ways in which technology and tradition are interrelated. Um, there's two questions I, I want to get to before we're out of time. One was, uh, is it inherently problematic to portray a fantasy race analogous to indigenous people if done in a serious manner? No, like I, I brought up the the example of um, Ixataka in Skies of Arcadia, and that was a great example. Um, I personally am working on a game uh, to, right now, it's just called Testament, and it features, um, you know, native characters in a fantasy setting. Uh, Treachery and Beatdown City does not have that many native characters, because I haven't really gotten around to designing any, but... Um, and also please pre-order. Uh, it's, it does have like, it is set in a semi fantasy setting. Like it, it's not New York city. It's, you know, East Fulton city. So no, so long as, as things are respected, like in odd world strangers wrath, you know, that was another great example of, of a fantasy ish setting or fantasy setting that did a really good job with it. And you know what? The beautiful, I love that game. That is phenomenal. The way that it was done and it touched on the themes was so beautiful. And at the end, there's a quote that's very simple. Like you go through the whole game and you're thinking, um, and I think it's a quote from Chief Standing Bear, I'm pretty sure. And so you go through this whole game and you have this experience and, uh, and it's very emotional and you get tied to the characters in this fantasy world. And then at the very end, very subtly, very subtly layered in that this is related to what has already happened and is still happening today and related to um, the experience of, of Native people. Um, really well done the way that they did that. And, you know, it's interesting, a lot of people in the indigenous media world even um, create, uh, you know, fictional essentially are based on um names of reservations and communities and art styles and clothing and all of these sorts of aspects um, partially to protect the knowledge. So um, we do it ourselves all the time. And I think at times that it probably is um, as long as you're not falling into the pan Indian, you know, trap where you're taking from everything you want and then actually geographically 
messing things up. If you're putting it in another world, um, if you're creating things that seem, you know, regionally sensible, then it can be a very beautiful thing to do that. Um, for sure, for sure. Hi, folks. I'm going to jump in here. Uh, We are at time. So if you could take just a moment to give some closing thoughts, then we'll move on to our next panel talking about art history and art games. Um, Well, I wanted to thank you guys for having us. And, uh, you know, it's it's been a pleasure. And I, I think that we've informed a lot of people, and I hope that any questions they have, they can just direct it at us. You know, uh, I may not, you know, I, I'm specific to my tribe, but I can get you in touch with any other tribe if you want to learn about them. So if you want to make games about Native people, definitely hit me up. Yeah, miigwech. This is a great opportunity for us. Uh, and I hope that we can make meaningful connections and stay in touch and inspire um, the next generations and ourselves and continue to to move forward in this good work. Thank you, miigwech. Seneco Kakona. Thank you both. Uh, I just want to say that I personally feel that I've come out of this learning a few things, uh, uh, just even just for me personally, for various reasons. Uh, thank you both. This has been really important to us, and we really appreciate you both taking time out of your day to come join us here at Indy3. Uh, uh, if you could maybe hang out in the chat a little bit and answer any questions that people have, that would be amazing. And But I'm going to go and set up our next panel, so I will uh, say goodbye and take just a moment to do that. Thank you again. Yeah, that sounds great. I'd love to. Thank you.